All right, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I've been looking forward to this all month. Um, okay, so just to double check, you can all see my research stream slide now and, okay, great. Uh, so yes, uh, my name is Emily Garbinski um, and I just wanted to start with sort of a broad overview of all of the types of work that I'm interested in. Uh, just in case there's any potential for collaboration sometime in the future. Uh, so very broadly, my work falls under three different umbrellas. Uh, so I have a stream of research on how couples make financial decisions. Uh, I'm also really interested in uh, the antecedents and consequences of saving money. And then I have a third stream of research that focuses on happiness and how we can increase consumption enjoyment. Uh, so today I'm going to be focusing mainly on the second stream, and I'm hoping to present two different papers that I've been working on because I think while they are two distinct projects with a different set of co-authors, uh, they are related. Um, Okay, so the first paper that I want to present today is titled Financial Monitoring, Liquid Wealth and Well-Being. And this is joint work with Joe Gladstone, who's on faculty at CU Boulder, as well as Melanie Rudd, uh, who's on the faculty at the University of Houston. Uh, and so before I dive into specifics on this paper, uh, I wanted to start with sort of a few high level questions uh, for the audience. So you don't have to answer these out loud, you can just answer them uh, internally. But I want you to take a few seconds to think about the following. Uh, so my first question is, how frequently do you check your primary bank accounts? Uh, so would you say this is something that you check on a daily basis? Do you check it once a week, uh, once a month, or even less than that? I also want you to think about how much money is in your primary checking account right now. So if someone were to ask you this question, uh, would you know this amount within, say, $10, $50, $100, or even more than that? Right? And so uh, the point that I'm trying to get across here is that there is individual variance in how frequently people check their liquid wealth. Uh, and so according to a recent survey from Lexington Law, uh, people fall into these buckets where about a third of Americans uh, check this amount every day. Uh, approximately another third tend to check how much money is in their bank account once a week. Whereas the rest of us, uh, and I actually fall into this group, uh, tend to check their wealth uh, or their primary bank account monthly or even less than that. Uh, and so key point that I'm trying to make here is that people vary in this degree to which they monitor their personal checking and savings accounts. Uh, and in this paper, we refer to this individual variance as differences in financial monitoring. And so when I talk about financial monitoring in this work, we're talking about both the frequency with which one checks their personal bank account, as well as their knowledge of how much money is in these accounts. Um, and so as you can imagine, frequency and knowledge are two distinct constructs, but they're very highly correlated, such that the more often you check your primary bank account on average, uh, the more accurate uh, or the more knowledge you tend to have about how much money is in these particular accounts. Right? And I also want to be clear, um, just because I know this is an interdisciplinary audience, that in this work, we're looking specifically at the extent to which consumers monitor their personal checking and savings. So this isn't a paper looking at investors or how frequently they, for example, trade. Um, we're focusing specifically on the consumer side and their day-to-day -day finances and what those look like. Okay. Uh, so taking a step back, what do we know about monitoring more generally? Uh, so if you look at the research that exists, uh, what we think is interesting is that past work tends to suggest that monitoring is something that's actually very beneficial for well-being. Uh, so if we talk about monitoring from the goals literature, for instance, 
Uh, monitoring tends to be considered this critical step in the process of self-regulation. Um, it's often considered something that helps people attain their goals and therefore uh, something that's considered beneficial to the consumer. Uh, if we look specifically at the information avoidance mo uh, literature, so sort of the opposite of monitoring, this would be not monitoring at all, uh, what we know is that when we tend to avoid crucial information, it can deprive people of useful feedback that they might be able to use to fine tune their behavior. Um, and information avoidance also has a lot of negative effects. For example, it licenses people to behave more selfishly, which we know is something that is associated with decreased well-being. And if we look at the behavioral finance literature, uh, monitoring has lots of positive effects. So for example, it's associated with better budgeting. Uh, and a recent field experiment where researchers endowed some consumers with debit cards uh, found that people that were given debit cards monitored their bank accounts more frequently, and this ultimately increased the amount of trust that people had in banks and financial institutions more generally. Okay. Um, academic literature aside, uh, lay intuition and practitioner intuition seems to suggest that monitoring your finances is a good thing. So this is just one example of the dozens of digital apps that exist that are aimed to help consumers consolidate their bank account so that they can get a more complete picture of their current financial state. Right. So taken together, there's a lot of different pieces of literature uh, that suggests that financial monitoring is something that's beneficial. It's something that we as consumers should be doing. And the question that uh, my co-authors and I wanted to ask in this particular paper is, is this actually true? Um, and more specifically, is more frequent financial monitoring something that's always beneficial for every consumer? And so as you can imagine, uh, the answer that we arrived at in this particular paper is that it depends. Uh, and more specifically, we find that it depends on the amount of liquid wealth that a consumer currently has, right? So why should this matter? Uh, well, if we think about this from a theoretical perspective, Steph Tully and Isha Sharma have uh, a recent paper that just came out last year where they propose that there's different routes to people's assessments of their subjective wealth. Um, and so one of the routes that they propose is what they refer to as this comparative route, which is just this idea that when forming judgments, people use reference points. And our hypothesis is that the more frequently people are checking their bank account, the more likely they are to use the amount of money that's in there as a reference point. Uh, so as you can imagine, if I'm someone that's constantly monitoring my bank account and the amount's much lower than I might have expected, right, this could have a negative effect uh, on my current financial well-being. They also propose uh, a third route, which they refer to as the self-perception route. So same idea, just a bit broader. And so this is the idea that if I'm constantly monitoring my bank account, that might make me more likely to draw, to draw conclusions about myself and my own personal level of financial responsibility. So if I'm constantly monitoring my bank account and I see that that number is relatively low, right? this may, may, might make me think that I'm not as financially responsible as I thought I was, right? making me feel bad about myself, having a negative effect on my current well-being. Right. So regardless of which route is operating, uh, we make the same hypothesis in terms of the relationship between financial monitoring, uh, liquid wealth, and financial well-being. And the hypothesis is as follows. So what we're predicting is that uh, when liquid wealth is relatively high, financial monitoring should have a positive effect on well-being. But if my liquid wealth is relatively low, we predict that financial monitoring will actually have a negative effect on my current financial well-being. And when it comes to defining financial well-being, I want to be really clear about what we're referring to in this particular paper. Uh, so we use a paper that was published in JCR in 2018 by Nettie Meyer and colleagues. And in this particular paper, 
they break down financial well-being into different components. So when I'm thinking about my own financial well-being, uh, that can be something that's relative or something that's more absolute. And in this paper, we focus on absolute financial well-being. And in particular, we're looking at people's current level of money management stress. So how worried are they about their current financial situation? Um, and ultimately, how is this affecting their ability to live life in the fashion that they would like to live it? So uh, the paper currently has a set of six studies. Uh, mm -hmm. In the interest of time, I won't go through all six of these in detail, but I did want to give you a high level overview as to what we find in this particular paper. Uh, so in the paper, as it currently stands, we use a lot of uh, secondary data sets. Uh, we did, however, run a pre-registered experiment on prolific academic where we manipulated whether or not we asked people to check their bank accounts either before or after we assessed their well-being. Um, we do find a similar set of results in this experiment that we do across our secondary data sets. Uh, the reason why I'm not going to be presenting the experiment today is because uh, this is a one-shot study where we ask people to either check their bank account or not. Um, and it doesn't fully tap into this phenomenon of what we're trying to get at in this particular paper. So we're trying to look at how frequently people are checking, how often they're checking, which is inherently a longitudinal phenomenon. Uh, so we're currently trying to see uh, if there's a bank or other financial institution that's willing to work with us so that we can get insights into people's behaviors over time. Uh, but for now, in order to get at this question, we are looking at a lot of secondary data sets. And in particular, I'm going to show you a longitudinal data set uh, in study five. Okay. Okay. So um, starting with study one, what's the basic phenomenon? So here we used a panel survey from the UK that was administered by the BBC. And in this particular survey, uh, participants were asked the following questions that we use to tap into their current level of financial monitoring. So they were asked questions such as how often they check how much money they have available in their current bank account, how accurately they know how much money they have in their current bank account, and how often they normally check uh, their current bank account. And so we use these three measures to assess their frequency of financial monitoring. In terms of liquid wealth, uh, we knew their level of savings, and in this case, it was reported as a categorical variable. And then for the financial well-being measures, we had access to these uh, following three questions. So first, how optimistic are you about your personal financial future? Are you increasingly anxious about whether you can pay your bills? And then statements to describe how well they're keeping up with their bills and credit commitments. And then, of course, we had uh, a few relevant covariates, such as age, gender, relationship status. And so what we found was the following pattern. Uh, so uh, a significant interaction between uh, account monitoring and liquid wealth on financial well-being. And so more specifically, what we see is that at higher levels of liquid wealth, greater account monitoring was associated with higher levels of financial well-being, right? But we saw the opposite pattern at lower levels of liquid wealth. So more specifically in this particular data set, for those that had savings of $11,000 or less, we saw that lower account monitoring was actually associated with higher financial well-being than higher account monitoring, right? So we see this significant reversal at these lower levels of liquid wealth. Right. We also uh, obtained access to a panel survey from the Netherlands uh, that allowed us to test uh, the same question. So how do financial monitoring and liquid wealth interact uh, when it comes to forming financial well-being <clears throat> assessments? Uh, we see the exact same pattern in this Dutch panel. Um, and so in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to study three, where we collaborated with a large multinational research uh, retail bank. Um, and what this bank enabled us to do was survey 
912 of its current customers who indicated that this was their primary banking institution. Uh, and what these customers also allowed us to do was to match their survey responses with their previous year's worth of transaction data. And so the reason this was really attractive to us was because it was an opportunity for us to get insights into people's financial monitoring tendencies that were not just self-reported. Right? So what did their actual interactions look like with their bank? Uh, and these were measures that we obtained directly from the bank itself. Uh, so in terms of our financial monitoring measure in this study, what we did was we actually summed interactions with the bank for each participant and standardized this measure. And when I say interactions from the bank, these are the interactions uh, that the bank gave us access to. Uh, so we knew, for example, if they engaged in any mobile transfers, how often they used an ATM, how often they logged into their online bank account, if they went to an actual branch store, or if they phoned the bank. Uh, and as you can see from this graph here, by far the two most common behaviors are using an ATM and logging in online. But since we had access to all of these uh, measures, we just uh, summed all of them and used all of the data that we had access to. Right. In terms of liquid wealth, what did we use? So we used their average bank reported balance of checking and savings accounts. Uh, our financial well-being measure came directly from the survey that we administered to participants. So you can see here these three items about losing sleep, worrying about money, their confidence in their ability to handle an unexpected expense, and their current satisfaction with their financial situation. And then, of course, covariates, age, gender, employment, relationship status. Uh, so in this data set, uh, we unfortunately didn't observe a significant crossover at higher levels of liquid wealth, but as you can see, this pattern is trending in the direction that we expect. Uh, and what we do observe is this significant effect uh, for lower levels of liquid wealth. And so more specifically, we see the same pattern that we see in the other two studies that Lesser account monitoring is actually associated with greater financial well-being than higher account monitoring um, on these lower levels uh, of liquid wealth. And in this case, this is the pattern that we observed for more than half of the participants in the sample. Okay, so uh, in study four, uh, we extended our investigation to look not just at financial well-being, but how does this affect subjective well-being more generally? Um, and so because studies four and five, uh, we obtained very similar results, I want to focus on study five, since that's the longitudinal data set uh, that we used in this paper. Right? So uh, in study five, we once again used um, this panel data from the UK. Uh, and this is a publicly available survey that's conducted every two years. Um, and so you can see in this graph here uh, the measures that we care about. So we, of course, cared about financial well-being, subjective well-being, financial monitoring, and liquid wealth. And you can see the waves in which these measures uh, are available in the survey. Okay, so the first thing that we did uh, for this study data, um, and just to give you a, an idea of the measure, so once again, very similar to the measures in the other secondary data set. So financial monitoring, we looked at how accurately they know the balance of their primary bank account, how normally they check how much money is in the account. Uh, for liquid wealth, we used the total value of participants' checking accounts because that's the measure we had access to. Um, and then financial well-being, you can see in the past 12 months, how often have you had money left over compared with two years ago? Do you think your general financial position is better, worse, or about the same? And then subjective well-being, uh, we use life satisfaction measures and also current levels of happiness. Uh, so the first thing that we did uh, with this data set is we pulled all of the data together just to look at these general patterns that we're seeing. Uh, and once again, for financial well-being, we see exact same pattern that we see in our other studies, such that at higher levels of liquid wealth, we see that high account monitoring is associated with greater financial well-being than lower account monitoring. And we get this reversal 
uh, at lower levels of liquid wealth. We see the exact same pattern here for subjective well being. Uh, but what was most interesting to us is because this is a longitudinal survey, we wanted to look at these within person effects. Um, and so as you can see from the table here, we get a significant within person interaction between liquid wealth and financial monitoring. And so more specifically, what we find in this data set is that within the same person, as their liquid wealth changes over time, so too does the effect of financial monitoring on financial well-being. And so more specifically, uh, when liquid wealth is relatively high, we see that financial monitoring has a positive effect on financial well-being. But when liquid wealth is relatively low, we find that financial monitoring has a negative effect on financial well-being. Uh, also with this data set, uh, we did conduct a moderated mediation analysis. So uh, we looked at account monitoring and liquid wealth at time one, how that affected financial well-being at time two, and then in turn, how that affected subjective well-being at time three. Uh, and so what we find is that there seem to be these longitudinal effects such that how frequently I'm monitoring my bank account is affecting my financial well-being over time, which is having a longer term effect on my overall subjective well-being or life satisfaction. Okay, so key takeaway uh, from this particular paper is that financial monitoring, even though there's a lot of evidence that suggests that this is something beneficial that we should be doing. We wanna highlight that this may not be as psychologically beneficial as we think, and particularly the case for people with lower levels of income or of liquid wealth. And the reason why we think this is interesting is because we see a lot of these apps or a lot of these digital tools are specifically targeted towards lower income individuals. And so one thing that I want to be very clear about is I don't want the key takeaway of this paper to be, oh, people with low liquid wealth just shouldn't monitor their bank accounts. Uh, that's, not, that's not the key takeaway we're trying to provide. But what we are trying to provide insight to is to think about how marketers and policymakers can use these insights to encourage consumers to engage with their finances, to monitor their finances in a way that prevents them from becoming completely stressed and overwhelmed, especially if the amount of money they have available is not what they expected it to be. And so with that, thank you so much, Emily, for all of uh, your wonderful insights and, and sharing your time with us. There is one thing in closing that we'd like to share with you. All right. Um, yeah, we just wanted to thank you, Emily, too, for making the time to talk to us. And uh, we have a gift for you that will only grow. We had uh, 50 trees planted in your honor. So thank That you is so, much. so cool. Oh, my gosh. Coolest gift ever. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you yeah, so much. no, thank you. 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 Thank